UNESCO is now about to publish a book entitled Migration and Climate Change, uh, whose purpose is to assess the relationship between, on the one hand, climate change and, on the other hand, migration. So both topics are key issues for the world today, so we're trying to assess the relationship between those two big issues. The current situation is that either this relationship is not done because climate change is approached as exclusively as a natural science issue or because migration is understood as a strictly economic process, for example, and so, we, or on the other hand, if the connection is made, all too often it's made in a very alarmist way. So the book tries to disentangle different dimensions of this, uh, of the, the, of the migration for in relation to environmental factors. Uh, for example, it tries to understand exactly how the process works because one, what what often observes is that climate change creates increased precariousness in sending societies, which in turn motivates people to migrate. So it's a largely indirect causality between climate change and migration. Also what can see is that uh, in many cases migration is internal. People move to another place within the country or sometimes they move temporarily for uh, part of the year and then they come back or sometimes only one member of the family or the household leaves so that he can he or can she send money back to the family. Um, so there are all kinds of patterns that develop around this migration climate change uh, relationship. The book also sheds light on the regions of the world which are most affected. So we can notably mention the, the small island states, which are very often situated only a few meters above sea level, which means that they may simply disappear uh, over time. Other regions highly touched and concerned by climate change include, for example, the delta of large rivers like the Nile in Egypt or the Ganges in Bangladesh, regions that are often densely populated and that may suffer from droughts or from uh, flooding, for example. And then we have old arid or semi-arid regions like the Sahel in Africa, in which the agricultural economy may be massively threatened by, for example, uh, long-term droughts uh, that will make it necessary for people to look for other kinds of subsidence. There's a big uh, legal uh, case uh, around the status of the people who have to leave a country that does no longer exist. It's a, it's a big issue in terms of inventing new forms of protection for people from a disappearing state. Uh, another issue is the, the, the question of refugee. We know that all too often environmental migrants are called climate refugees, for example. It's difficult to use the word refugee because the Geneva Convention, which, uh, which provides the only internationally recognized definition of refugees, does not mention environmental factors. So we cannot really talk about refugees, but still there's a dimension of forced migration in the case of people who move for climate change reasons, and this needs to be assessed. Uh, and again, we need to be imaginative in terms of how legal frameworks could be envisaged to protect the people who, who, who need protection. Another issue is the ethical issue in the sense that, uh, for example, when a state disappears, when people have to move because of climate change, who is responsible for what? What kind of status uh, should be granted to these people? Are they simply migrants, as uh, often uh, claimed, like only economic migrants, or do they deserve a special protection? If so, who is to provide this protection? Is it uh, rich uh, receiving states or is it states in the region? These are all issues that need to be addressed both from an ethical and political perspective.